Dennis, I did my doctorate in the biological sciences and neuroscience. We called it brain research at the time. It shows you how old I am. Um, and I've always been interested in philosophy uh, in, in my life, um, philosophy of mind, uh, philosophy of religion, philosophy of mathematics, physics, whatever. But I never brought the two together. I never thought philosophy of biology, that there was anything relevant there until recently when I began, began to appreciate it. And I want to ask you, as a, uh, a, a great uh, physiologist uh, in terms of the work that you've done, and in uh, recent decades you're pioneering thinking about new ways to think about biology, that uh, what, what is the purpose of philosophy of biology and how can it uh, give, give, our, give us new ways of progressing in science? Well, you know, it's deep in the name of my subject, physiology. <laughs> the original Greek is life, logic, the study of. Uh, uh. Who could possibly object or have any problems with the idea that we should explore the logic of what we observe mm. and what we think about what we observe and how we interpret it. That is what philosophy is. Mm. It is the logic of the way you put things together. And I really cannot understand why people should have any problem with that. We take logic as used in mathematics and we apply it endlessly to biology now. Uh, I did that with the heart, goodness knows how many years ago. Now, Logic, in a philosophical sense, is much the same. It's asking the question, what is consistent with what we observe? And that is a logical question. Mm -hmm. Now, we may get that wrong. There may be many things that are consistent with what we observe, mm -hmm. and what we choose amongst the possible consistencies is a matter of discussion and, and also the future research. But what generates that future research are the ideas that say, well, out of these possibilities, can we distinguish between these? That mm -hmm. then becomes experimental. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an automatic process of hypothesizing about the science we know, and then the attempt to refute, I'm Popperian, you see, <laughs> um, <laughs> the attempt to refute those hypotheses, but that's how science advances. Mm -hmm. We have an idea that this set of observations in our science may could be consistent with this interpretation. But is there another way in which we can test whether that is true? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing all the time. Mm -hmm. That's my subject. Mm -hmm. That is physiology, <laughs> which is the physio of logos, <laughs> which is the logic of life. And I think that's biological philosophy. And what you are doing, uh, though, more than some, is um, looking, looking at mechanisms in very novel ways that uh, are somewhat heretical. Yes, uh, that's right. And uh, we don't want to use the cliché of paradigm shift, but it seems to be appropriate. <laughs> well, I don't mind that if people want to describe it as a paradigm shift. I think, yes, for somebody to say the organism, as I do say, the organism effectively, when under stress and needing to, it can effectively instruct the genome to change. Mm. Now, it doesn't mean to say that it pulls these mm. nucleotides here and pushes them over there. Uh, it might do that too, but I don't know. <laughs> what it means is that that DNA can generate novelty anyway, every time it replicates. So what it does mean is that organisms can go in and use those errors of replication to find out whether any of them are useful. Mm. Now, that's the sense in which I think what I'm doing is turning the standard view of genetics upside down. I'm saying it cannot be from DNA upwards to create our body and mind, to quote one author. Mm -hmm. Um, it has to be the case that organisms know when it is necessary to start spinning the wheel of chance, is the way I would put it, to arrive at solutions that they don't yet have. Mm. And if you want to call that a philosophical view of biology, 
I'm happy with that. I, I certainly would, because it, by turning the, the uh, traditional way of thinking upside down, it, it forces us to uh, have, as uh, a famous philosopher David Luce said, an incredulous stare. The first thing you do is, you know, are you serious? Are you serious? <laughs> and yes. then, uh, then, then you think uh, uh, of, the, of, of, of the data that supports what you say, and it's complex, but it, it changes your, your perspective. It does. And to yeah. me, even if that's wrong, if you are forced to change your perspective and, and see and, and look afresh at, that's at right. what you're doing, that's enormous progress. And what that does is to be creative in thinking of new ways of thinking about what you already know. And then you can ask the question, what experiment can I do mm -hmm. to test that? Mm -hmm. I never go beyond... Well, people do. They call it metaphysics. <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine for those who wish to do it. I, I am a metaphysician to this extent, in the sense that I think we do have to speculate beyond what the experiments show. Otherwise, we've got no scheme of interpretation. Mm -hmm. But I always stay with speculation that can be empirically tested. Mm -hmm. But that means I'm open to new experiments, new experiments that show the extent to which organisms under certain circumstances start to alter their genomes. Mm -hmm. And what are the precise molecular processes by which a cell surface way out there can communicate with the genome, uh, not only say, I want more protein of this particular gene, but also I want to jiggle the, pro the, the DNA around a mm -hmm. bit. Those are exciting areas of experimentation, which mm. I would want to encourage. Mm. So I'm not only, as it were, saying you've got to be philosophical in biology, you've got to be creative in your ideas and what you interpret of the experiments you already know, but you've also got to go out there on the edge and say, what can we out of this now experimentally test? I think it would be marvelous if mm. people could work out exactly how the organism as a whole can tell the genome to start jiggling around and producing new DNA. Is there research along those lines? There are indeed, yes. Um, two groups have already revealed how the cell transmits little messages down the tubes. Believe it or mm. not, there are tube lines in cells. Mm. They're called tubulins. Mm. They're proteins that enable little motors mm. to walk on them and bring a message down. And that message says to the nucleus, please make more of this protein. Mm. Thank you very much. Yes. That's right. But you see, there's no reason why that shouldn't be a message that says, please start hypermutating. Mm. I'm sure somebody oh. will discover that. Oh. We've already got the pathway that says, please make more protein. Uh, that's been done by one team in New York University, one of my former students, Richard Chen, and by a team here in Oxford in my department, and um, uh, dear me, Professor Parekh. Yeah. Yes, I sometimes <laughs> forget. Anyway, um, now that's already shown. What's needed is to find the same process, that's called electrotranscription coupling. Mm. That is a long word for saying, mm. please make more of this protein. <laughs> I want to look at electrogenome editing coupling, and that would be a marvelous discovery. But there's a, a challenge for physiologists around the world. Mm. Can somebody find out exactly which process does that? It won't be easy because these require very clever techniques, but I think it would be a brilliant discovery. You would get a Nobel Prize, I'm it, sure. It, it, and it is a wonderful example of the uh, recursive, iterative uh, approach when philosophy uh, of biology, that way of thinking, can generate a new idea which requires an experiment, which, exactly uh, which so. then triggers some people to begin to think what kind of an experiment, which would go back and, and then uh, uh, re either reinforce or adjust Indeed the so. original theory. Indeed so. That's the process of the advance of science. Yes, exactly. <laughs>